you know, I really do enjoy sharing my experience. I've been in the industry now for about 25 years, and I can tell you. So, so the next, the last part of this, we're just going to talk about equipment and really focus on part load and see, you know, my experience is full load is pretty easy to design for, although you can get into problems there. But it's really understanding what happens in part load in the space is in terms of the SHR, the sensible heat ratio, and how the equipment responds to that space condition. Because if we're trying to achieve a window of, you know, temperature and humidity, it's important that we can do that at part load as well as below conditions. So I hope that, you know, when you leave here, you have a sense for using psychometrics to see what happens at part load. And I'm a very visual person, so this is very helpful to me. This is kind of how I learned it um, in my career. And, you know, if you're new, I could tell you one of the biggest problems we see uh, as far as humidity control out in the in the real world is, is the lack of the equipment uh, having the right features or controls to control part load. And, and take it from me, those situations could be very painful for everybody involved. So, so if you're new, please, um, Check this out, and you could always rewatch these. I think the first two, and then this one, are also going to live on Armstrong's uh, library. They have a lot of great uh, presentations there. Okay, so that's my little intro. So we're going to look at these two um, conditions here. Excuse me, I'm going to go back here. That I should say part load on the bottom. So the full load SHR, and these are the examples we used in the Psychometrics two presentation. So the full load SHR is a eighty thousand over one hundred thousand. Um, SHR sensible heat ratio, as you all probably know, that's a 0.8, and we're going to design for that. And then we're going to see what happens at part load, uh, which is the 47,000 over the 67,000, and that would represent a 0.7 part load condition, which is pretty reasonable. And we're going to look at a reduction in sensible heat to get there and kind of see what happens. So we're going to play around with this equation. Uh, if you are new, this is the sensible heat equation. Very important. It's one of those that we use all the time throughout our careers whether you're calculating sensible heat of a space or sensible heat of a coil, electric heater, et cetera. So this is a good one to know. The Q uh, S is the um, um, sensible BTUs. The 1.085 has to do with specific heat and density. It is not a constant, but at sea level, we're gonna use this and use it throughout the example. CFM, cubic feet per minute, and Delta T in this case, since we're looking at the room, is the, the Delta T of the air, coming into the room and then leaving the room, okay? Supply air, um, let's say space temperature set point or return air minus the supplier temperature. So we're gonna plug some numbers into this equation and kind of get um, a working model to play around with, okay? So we look at the full load, we have the 80,000, 1.085 times 75, which in this case is gonna be the design condition we're gonna design for. And we're gonna start with 53 degree supplier because because we know the unit probably should be around there. And we're just gonna pick that arbitrarily. In the real world, in your software, this is an iterative process, but for here, we're just gonna lock it in at 53 and, and play around with that. So if you do that, you get a 3,350 CFM system. So here's what we're, gonna, what we're gonna design to. So we need an eight ton system, 3,350 CFM, 8067 mixed air temperature, 9578 wet for the design OA, a nice steamy, sweltery day. And we're going to say uh, 75 degrees dry and 50% RH space condition. Okay, so let's play around with this a little bit and see what happens at full and part load. So in the beginning here, we're going to use this. Well, throughout most of this, the rest of this presentation, we're going to focus on a constant volume chill water air handling unit. Okay, this would be your typical, you know, modular climate changer type product or a larger blower coil, maybe a very large fan coil, very eight tons, but um, a chill water valve, which is modulating or on off and a constant volume supply fan. The next psychometrics one we do is gonna concentrate on VAV, but for now we're just gonna stick with a constant volume unit. Okay, so you got your 8067 entering the coil, that's your mixed air temperature. We decided we're gonna enter the space at, at 53. So we've, you know, let, leaving the coil at 51, accounting for one degree of fan heat and one degree of duct heat, that gets us into the space at, at 53 degrees. So this is kind of a working model of a, a full load condition. All right, we go over to the psych chart and we're gonna plot that and kind of see how that looks. And let me just see here. Okay, so, so our space design intent is 75 degrees and 50%, which is right there. Our outdoor air condition for this example is 95, 78. 
And we know that the mixed air falls on a line that's somewhere between those because we've all watched and rewatched psychometrics one and two over and over again, I am sure. So that's our mixed air temperature that goes into the coil. And that's your typical coil curve, which goes from right to left, sensibly cooling. And then when it gets to a certain point, um, this the air, the moisture starts dropping out and we would leave per our example at 51. Now that dot looks like it's right on the saturation line, which probably needs to be scooched over a little bit to the right because the air doesn't actually leave at 51, 51. If you, you look at your equipment selections, you'll see like a 51 degree leaving and maybe 50.5 wet. So it never leaves 100% on the saturation line because there's some bypass and stuff in there too. So, so just to note that. And then we have this line here representing our two degrees of heat pickup, one for the fan, one for the duct. And then we end up here. So now we are at a point where we're going to put this air into the space. And I'll kind of blow this up a little bit. So this air should be at the correct proportion of, you know, dryness and coolness, for lack of a better word, that it will hit the SHR, absorb the heat and, and moisture in a ratio that will result in the desired room design. So we'll look at that. So 0.8, boom. Okay. So again, the air goes into the cooling coil, gets cooled down, we reheat it two degrees, then it absorbs the heat and humidity in the correct ratio to end up at the design condition. I will note too that most systems are designed for sensible heat or temperature control only and dehumidification is a byproduct. And that's the vast majority of products. And if they're designed properly, it's usually not a problem, but there are a lot of cases where we have to actually control, actively control humidity. Now, we just looked at the full load, which was the 0.8. So let's see what happens to this same equipment scenario at a 0.7 SHR. So let's say for sakes of this example, we've got the same OA conditions. And I know at part load, you probably won't, but let's just say to make this easy so we don't have to replot a bunch of stuff, that we have the same outdoor air conditions and it's only a decrease in sensible heat. So you've, you know, the blinds are shut, you've turned some computers off, lights off, or you have an existing facility or you've upgraded to low, low energy LED lights, which uh, can actually be a big problem if you change the SHR too much by doing that. So that's a whole other discussion, but that can happen. So, all right, so let's take our equation, our sensible heat equation, and we're gonna plug in some data here for the part load. Okay, so this was our full load condition. We had 80,000 BTU sensible over 1.085 times 75 minus 53, but it's not 80,000 anymore, right? It's, it's 47,000. Okay, so I'm kind of using this to show you what has to change in the system to balance this equation, right? We've already determined it was a constant volume system. So in this case, we cannot change the CFM, okay? So we, want, we don't wanna change the 75 degrees for the room temp design, because that was the design intent. The 1.085 is not gonna change. The 47,000 is what it is. So the 53 is the, the only thing that can change there, okay? I'll go back here. So, we, so we, can, we can raise that temperature. And if we solve for delta T, we will see that it turns out to be approximately 13. I think it's 12.93. So I rounded up to 13 to keep it kind of simple. And if we go back to the equation, we can solve for that 75 minus 13 is 62 degrees. Now that is our new supply temperature. Okay, so now this is our kind of balanced, I would call it a balanced part load sensible heat equation. Okay, same CFM, lower sensible heat and a different, a different supply air temperature. So if we go back and look at our example, here's what would happen. So we're, we're originally, we're putting 53 degree air in the space. And as the heat load in the space dropped, the 53 degree air became too cold, right? So the thermostat says it's getting cold in the space. It backs off the chill water valve and it balances out at 60 degrees. Um, and then we got a few degrees of reheat here. So it balances out at this temperature to not overcool the space, right? And again, it doesn't care about humidity. Most systems are not looking at the relative humidity in the space. So it's only reacting to to the temperature in the space, the sensible temperature in the space. So now let's look at what that looks like 
on the psychometric chart. We're just going to overlay that that scenario on top of on top of the 0.8 uh, representation here. So, so we have the coil leaving air temperature. Remember, the chill water valve has backed off because it's getting too cold in the space, which is represented by that blue dot there. And then we've got a few degrees of fan heat, and then we've got the 62 degrees there supply air. And I'm just going to blow this up real quick. So you can look at this and you can imagine like what's going to happen now when we draw this 0.7 SHR, where are we going to end up on the psychometric chart? Are we going to be at the 75 degrees, 50% RH? Probably not, right? So if we draw that in, there's where you end up and I'll draw the area. So blow that up here. So what you're seeing is a classic example of, you know, part load issues when you have a modulating chill water valve and you have a constant volume system and you're only looking at temperature. You could see the design, uh, the, the space relative humidity is now 60% rather than 50. Is that a problem? It depends, right? It depends on the application. It depends on what the owner was looking for to begin with. Um, now I can tell you too, if you took this and put it at a 0.6 SHR, you probably have some serious issues. And if you had more outdoor, so all these things come into play. So, all right, so that's a, a conventional example of, of part load and what's going on there. So. so how do we get this system to, I don't know, give us the, the results we need at part load, right? So here's kind of the way I do it. And you could, you could think about this in many different ways. I always start with the, the intent in mind. So I put a dot here, I put a blue dot at the 75 degrees and 50% RH. And what I'm gonna do is just draw in this 0.7 SHR line. Okay, see that there? So now I know from my previous uh, SHR, or my previous presentations that if I take the air and land it on this SHR in the right CFM, that it will absorb the heat in the right, you know, temperature and humidity to, to meet the design intent. So I gotta get over to, let me change over to my, um, drawing tool here. We got to get over here somehow, right? So, all right, so let's let's just step back and look at the part load again. So our chill water valve has choked back. We're providing the 62 degree air to the space. We know that that's, that's not going to cut it, right? It's going to be sensibly cool, but it's going to be high humidity. So what if we took this unit and locked it in the 51 degrees? Like we have the controls, we have a sensor downstream of the coil, and we're just gonna dry out the air because we know it's getting too humid in the space, right? And we got our few degrees of heat pickup here. So let's go back to the psych chart and see how this would react. Okay, so I'm gonna draw my 51 degrees leaving the coil and a couple degrees of heat pickup. And now how do we get from this point to this point? Well, we do that by moving from right to left and that's called reheat. So whenever you see reheat on a job, this is an example of a classic, I'll blow that up here too, dehumidification cycle, right? My circle's a little off there. I'm getting better with this drawing tool, but it's, it's more difficult than it looks like. I gotta get one of those pens. But anyway, so this is a classic example of we're gonna lock in the coil leaving air temperature and we're gonna reheat the air to make up for the lack of heat in the space because the SHR has changed. So that's kind of how that, how that works. A port, important note here, reheat does not dehumidify the air, okay? It changes the relative humidity of the air, but it does not actually move any humidity or moisture from the air, only the cooling coil or, or a surface lower than the dew point air removes the, the humidity, at least in air conventional HVAC systems are other ways to do it too. So um, just a note to point out. Okay, and this is just a cleaned up version of the part load psychometrics. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. So we can move on and look at a few other things. So, um, you know, again, we're just trying to, you know, make sure people understand how you can kind of visually represent this in the psychometric chart to to um, keep you out of trouble. And I, I've learned most of what I've learned in psychometrics was going out to a job at part load and having humidity issues and thinking, well, why does it do, why is it doing that? You know, what's going on? And that's a great way to learn too, um, if you're due to the industry. Okay. 
So we know we need to deliver the Air at 62 sensibly to not overcool the space. So how do we do this um, in a way that will dehumidify the air and not, not overcool the space? Well, we do reheat like what we talked about, right? So if we got 51 leaving the coil, 52, and then this jump to 62, how do we get from 52 to 62? As we discussed, we reheat, but what do we use for reheat? Okay, so we have a couple different options here. And this, this is where it all gets a little bit hairy because I don't even know if you could do electric reheat anymore by code. I think in certain specific applications, maybe like surgery suites or uh, any type of life-saving facility you can, mostly you cannot um, use electric for reheat. And I don't even know if most places you can do use new energy for reheat either. So, um, but that's kind of one way to do it. You could also do it with gas heat and that uh, everything I said about electric kind of applies to the gas burner because that's new energy reheat and also with the new electrification and decarbonization movement, um, the possibility of doing that is, is definitely gonna be going away even further. But nonetheless, that is a way to, to reheat the air. Another way would be to use hot water from a boiler. Again, that would be new energy reheat. Check your codes, not sure if that's allowed or not. And again, if it's a boiler that uses gas and that's a whole other issue with the whole decarbonization movement. So um, yeah, so those are some examples of reheat. So what about heat recovery? You know, this is a common way to do it. Take that heat off the coil. We had a heat recovery coil here, it's before the fan, but it could be after the fan, it really just depends on the unit. And then we got a few degrees of heat. So here you can see you're, we're introducing the air at 62 degrees, but it's it's gonna be really dry. So the psychometrics in this would look great. Um, heat recovery, you know, you have a bunch of different options. There are D superheaters for, you know, hot refrigerant gas. There's heat recovery side stream chillers, which is a little small chiller. If you had a, a thousand ton chill water plant, you know, you put in a, I don't know, I'm just gonna take a stab at it, a 40 ton heat recovery chiller on a side stream. Uh, return water, you take the return water at 55-ish and you cool it down to 40, 44, 42, put that water back in the return loop. And then the byproduct of that is, is hot water. And you can put that in a storage tank and use that for reheat when you, when you need it. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, which is gaining uh, popularity again to the decarbonization movement is to use uh, something called heat pump uh, water heaters, which are becoming uh, a little bit more popular now. So I'm gonna give you a very crude representation of what this would look like. It's a lot more detailed than this. We had a few experts on talking about this and uh, can't get a little bit more complicated than what we're talking about here, but this will give you a general introduction and overview to how this would work for reheat. So this is a, your conventional centrifugal type chiller, your supply water to the cooling coil, your return water back to the evaporator barrel. This would represent your hot heat pump water heater uh, plant. And the way heat pump water heaters work are like any other heat pump, they take heat from one source and they move it around to another source. So this would be a water to water heat pump water heater where you're taking BTUs out of the return water line, which is great because you're taking some burning off the chiller, some burden off the chiller at the same time you are producing hot water, which you can use domestically throughout the building. And you can also use some of that for reheat. Now I consider this a form of heat recovery Technically, is that the case? I'm not really sure, but it looks pretty pretty cool to me. So that's another way to do it. Okay, so we talked a lot about reheat, constant volume systems, reheat, et cetera. What if we don't have reheat or want to use a reheat or can't use it? I'll look at a, two options here. I'm going to look at something called face and bypass, which has been around for a long time. And what's going on here is you have Get my pen working here. So it's called face and bypass because you've got dampers here on the face of the coil and you've got a damper here, which is bypassing the coil. So face and bypass. So what happens is the return air, or I'm sorry, the mixed air. So the air that is uh, OA plus return air is some of it goes across the cooling coil and we dry that out to a locked in temperature. We might have a temperature sensor there, drop locks it into 51 degrees. And then we bypass the air and use that air for reheat. And we do that at part low conditions. So um, in this scenario, you might have the bypassed air mixed with the 51 degree air. So the bypass is 8067, mixed air temperature we calculated earlier. 
mixes with the 51 degrees at 60, then we get a degree here and a degree here. So this is a great way to do some reheat without having a new energy source. You're using the, the heat of the mixed air temperature. How that would look on the psychrometric chart is like this. That would be our coil leaving air temperature. That would be our bypass temperature. And the mixing of the two would fall on a line that connects the two. And it falls there, get a few degrees of reheat, and we draw our 0.7 line here. And you can see there at the 0.7 part load, we're pretty darn close to the, to the design intent, which is good. Okay. So where you might, you know, fail on this scenario is if you had a lot of outdoor air, right? So you're bypassing air around the coil. So if you had like 50% outdoor air, you can get into a little bit of danger here. And I'm just going to kind of play around with this. So now your mixed air temperature is up here, right? I'm sorry, our bypass air is up here because it's 50% OA and it's mixing with this leaving coil temperature here. And it would fall along this line, which is represented there. Few degrees of heat. And I'm going through this kind of quick because I got a few more slides here and I want to leave time for questions, but please come back and watch this. You know, you can come back and sit through this and plot your psych chart and have all the fun you want, go through this stuff. So here you can see where it ends up at a 0.7 SHR. So still not too bad. You know, you're at 58-ish percent RH, which is better than having no face and bypass. Is that a problem? Again, who knows? Depends on your design intent, what the owner is expecting, the type of facility, et cetera. Now we're gonna run through return air bypass, which is one of my favorites, because it uses the relatively dry and relatively cool return air as the bypass rather than the mixed air, okay? So in this case, all of the OA is gonna go across the coil in, in um, conjunction with some of the return air, and then you're using the return air as the, the bypass air. So um, how that would look is something like this. So the 75, 50%, would mix with this 51 degrees and you would get 60 degree air, which is relatively cool and dry. So that's kind of how that shakes out. How that would look on the psychrometric chart is something like this. You've got your coil leaving temperature. And now remember we were on the face and bypass, we were using this up here as our mixed air, our bypass air. Now we're using the bypass air here. So you can see it's, it's quite a bit um, less humidity. And we just complete the cycle here. We draw the, you know, we go through the whole, the whole deal here, a couple degrees of reheat, 0.7. Boom, check that out. So we're now right in there on the, on the design antenna, very close to it, okay? And you can see if you had 50% out to air, which is just what this represented, you can see that really it doesn't have an effect, obviously, as long as your coils size properly, it doesn't have an effect on the psychrometrics of the return air bypass. It's really the same thing because you're putting all that air and dehumidifying it through the coil. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. So here's where you can get in a little bit of trouble with this. If you are in a scenario where you absolutely have to control the temperature and humidity over all low conditions, you know, maybe it's a pharmaceutical manufacturing or something like that, um, you can you know, get into a scenario of an SHR where you, you lose the humidity in the space. So this is an example of that. So if you had 0.6 SHR and you wrote that up here, you'd see you'd be about right here, right? Which is, I don't know, about 55%, still, still pretty darn good. But if you had to get down to here, we move this SHR line down to this point. So then we know we need to get the air over to here, right? I'm gonna blow this up so you can see that real quick. Uh, and then, you know, we need to get the air from there to there, and we do that by reheat. So what this is trying to show is if you have return air bypass plus hot gas reheat or some type of reheat, um, that you can really nail the, the temperature and humidity in the space over almost all low conditions. So this is a really nice system. I switched this over from, from chill water to DX so I could slip in a little plug for hot gas reheat, which is how we reheat in DX equipment. Um, we didn't talk a lot about DX, so I wanted to give a little shout out to DX equipment there. So that's kind of what's going on there.
Um, and you see here, so 68 degrees is where it needed to land on that SHR to make all this work. I hope that makes sense. I'm not going too fast here. So, okay, so if we look at this psychrometrically, 50% outdoor air, return air bypass, modulating hot gas reheat. This now represents our reheat because we had it before the fan, but it could be after the fan. It really doesn't matter. It just depends on the design of the system. And there we can see we've got it uh, ending up right where we need to. So that's return air bypass, 50% out there. I really like this type of scenario if you have to control humidity over all load conditions. And it's very efficient to look at the psychometrics of it and go through the calculations. So there's that. Okay. Uh, just a little plug here for DX systems. Again, we haven't talked a lot about that. Um, or not a plug, but just to, you know, to talk about hot gas reheat as a form of reheat. That's a better way of saying that. Um, if you're going to do reheat with, with, if you're going to do reheat at all, make sure it's modulating. Okay. That's kind of the purpose of this slide here. Make sure you have modulating compressors, modulating chill water valves, modulating hot gas reheat coils. Um, prefer to have VAV ECM fans. That is helpful too. When you're trying to control humidity, that's really something we're going to talk about in the next presentation. Thank you for joining. And I think we're doing questions and answers now, and uh, I'll switch it back over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Tony and John, for the informative session on psychrometrics and properties of air. We will now like to take the opportunity to answer any questions we can in this time. Again, to ask a question, please type your question in the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. We have several questions lined up. The first one being, when looking at a building envelope, where should the moisture and air barrier be placed? I can take that one, Tony. Um, thank you for jumping back to that slide. That's actually perfect. Um, so if you guys look at this this image, uh, you know either the right one or or any of these up here, um, you have an exterior cladding. Um, that's basically there to protect uh, your control layers from ultraviolet radiation and rain. And then you have uh, what would be considered like control layers, which are layers are going to be your air you know, air barrier, vapor barrier. Um, and that can go right behind the cladding to protect uh, your sheathing, because the sheathing is what you know. You don't want to have uh, moisture getting into that sheathing, getting into the the structural components of the wall, like the studs. And then once you have your your structural components, studs and whatnot, you can put your insulation in between the studs, and then you'll have uh, an interior finish, which will typically be a drywall, and then a permeable latex paint. Um, ASHRAE puts out a really good uh, design guide or, or ASHRAE building. Let's see, it's actually called ASHRAE Guide for Buildings in Hot and Humid Climates by Louis G. Harriman and Joseph Steebrook. Their ideal wall, as they would call it, uh, actually adds an additional layer of insulation. So they'll have a, a layer of cladding and then like a uh, rigid uh, insulation. And then they show a continuous waterproof um, uh, drainage layer that's going to be your uh, like fluid applied membrane or something along those lines for your moisture and air barrier and then you'll have um, sheathing and then wood studs additional insulation if required and then your interior wallboard and your uh, permeable paint um, one other thing is important to mention is that there is some sort of um, drainage uh, cavity or, or air gap um, so like if these were uh, like a vinyl siding, the vinyl itself has a space between the uh, the, the you know moisture barrier that will allow uh, air to circulate through there and and drainage out um, if needed. So that's kind of the the general consensus on it, according to according to the experts at least. Thank you, John. The next question is: What would be the best solution to solve a humidity problem in a space if repla replacing the existing equipment isn't an option? I could take uh, that. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, John. I didn't mean to. No, talk go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was trying to think of a slide applicable to that, but I guess uh, you know. So if you can't replace existing equipment, um, adding any type of if there's humidity issues, the first thing is to make sure you're like John talked about at the beginning, right? Do we have a tight building and are we confident that the unit's even sized right? Do we have a load we have confidence in? That's kind of how I roll when I go into a job and there's a problem. Like we look at that first and then we look at the equipment. Is it set up right? Is it even functioning 
as it was intended. Um, and if it doesn't have any type of humidity control, you can add that by adding controls to it. You typically would have to add some sort of reheat to the system, as we've talked about the many different types. You can also change that unit to a single zone VAV if it has the right components in there. I've had, actually had a, a cafetorium <laughs> is what we call them, which is, I think John showed a picture of, of one earlier, but where I went in there and the unit was not designed with humidity control. And it was at part load, it was in, insanely humid in there. It was really, I think it was a little bit oversized too. So we ended up changing it to a single zone VAV, which basically in that scenario, you control the leaving air temperature off the coil, maybe to 50 to 52 degrees, something like that. And you change the air volume based on the temperature in the space, right? So at full load, you're probably close to your full air volume. As the space sensible drops, your air volume decreases so you don't overcool the space. And it doesn't actively control humidity, but a byproduct of that is a really well dehumidified space. And I think um, John had, uh, John, you wanna address the, I think you, said something about adding a dehumidifier yesterday. You want to talk about that? Yeah, that, that that tends to work pretty well on on smaller DX systems. Like if you had a typical office building or a dentist office that's running split systems, you know, two to five tons, you don't really have the controls complexity or the, the equipment size to justify doing uh, major component changes. You know, I mean, you're basically down to either replacing your your equipment, which is very costly, you know, for a, a small business, or you can add a dedicated dehumidifier. Um, there are several products out on the market that are that are small, that are 70 to 205 pints a day ish range that you can use, and you can either take the air uh, right out of the space and then and then put it back into the space, and that'll add some sensible reheat uh, because that dehumidifier has a little cooling coil in it, and of course the compressor and condenser coil are in the same box, so. The air will come through. It'll dehumidify the air, cool the air down into the you know, 50s or, or lower, hopefully, and then you'll get uh, reheat off the compressor, reheat off the fan, and then all of the heat that was added back to the unit will be added back, you know, in in this box pretty much uh, as you go through that condenser coil. So you'll leave uh, maybe 92 or 80, 84, 89, 92 degrees, depending on how what the load is in the space and uh, or on that machine, and so you get reheat out of it. And and you are adding new heat to do that though, um, but it is a cost-effective, uh, easy solution where you only need a drain line, and a dedicated 115 volt receptacle uh, to make that to make that work. Um, and it, it doesn't really affect a whole lot of other things in the space because it, it won't run at full load uh, unless you have a huge moisture problem. But uh, at full load, the air conditioner should be doing the the brunt of the work. This is just a small supplement. Uh, to your to your standard system, but it, it is a cost-effective way of doing, it, especially as we move towards uh, you know variable refrigerant flow systems. Um, if you can't um, handle the load, uh, you don't have a dedicated outside air system that's going to handle your latent load. VRF doesn't really do a wonderful job of dehumidifying. They, they there is some, but not to the level uh, that you sometimes require, especially if you're trying to handle some some outside air. Uh, so those small dehumidifiers can can kind of fill in the gap. All right, thank you. Moving forward, will adding an energy recovery wheel to my existing system help to dehumid sorry dehumidify the space? Well, I can. I'll talk a little bit about that, and John, you could um, throw in your your. So it's so funny because the example I brought up earlier of the cafetorium, and I have a picture of it here. Um, that job had an energy recovery wheel, and the the the. I guess the myth or the confusion is folks think if they have an energy recovery wheel that that dehumidifies the space. It really does not. It, it really knocks down the humidity load in the outside air. It is an energy savings deal. But the dew point leaving the energy recovery wheel is higher, way higher, much higher typically than the dew point of the space. So it doesn't actually dry out the space. So adding an energy recovery wheel to a, a unit that um, is struggling to control humidity would would not uh, actually control humidity in the space. So that's a, a good question. John, you got any uh, thoughts on that? Um, the, the only other thing I have from that is, is experience from the past when I was in the contracting field is we would see sometimes where an energy recovery wheel was added um, in an effort to help dehumidify the outside airstream. Um, so the exhaust airstream has to be relatively cool and, and relatively dry in order to recharge the media that's on this wheel. On a total energy wheel, you've got a, 
a, a media that's either got an applied surface uh, surfacant of some sort that's going to absorb uh, moisture and transfer uh, sensible heat, or or some of them are just sensible heat only. But really, this is focusing on a on a total energy wheel that does uh, both latent mm -hmm. and sensible heat. If you don't have a dry, cool airstream coming out of the building, if you're already at a relatively high moisture content, the effectiveness of that wheel greatly drops because there's nothing there to recharge the wheel. So the mm -hmm. wheel stays moist. The moist air from outside comes in and it adds moisture to it. Very little of the moisture gets stripped off. So it's really not pulling that much moisture out of the outside air. So you can get this cascading effect where the building just kind of gets out of control and it gets to be you know, 72 or 73 degrees and... 65% relative humidity, and you, you can't recover it because there's no drying potential left in that outside airstream. It's, it's, the relative humidity is too high, and that's really what drying potential is. If you have a low relative humidity, there's a lot of drying potential. If you have a high relative humidity, the air can't absorb that much more moisture, so there's not much drying potential. If there's no drying potential for your wheel, the wheel's performance falls apart. So that's, that's where you really have an issue where it can actually almost make it worse because you've got a cold airstream. So you're transferring sensible, but you're not really transferring latent. You're just reducing the sensible load on the equipment, exasperating the already bad condition. So. Yeah. And I'll add this too, at part load, it was a good, a good explanation too. At part load, it's even worse because now your ability to exchange the, the energy is, you know, your, your outdoor, you can have a 78 degree and rainy day at part load and you're, you're not going to knock that down much with your, exhaust air and you know really it just comes down to the fact that to dehumidify you have to have a cold coil right and if you're trying to have a cold coil and there's not a lot of heat in the space you're going to over cold the space so that's really what it boils down to is getting in a situation where you can remove the the moisture from the airstream with the coil and not over cool the space and that's kind of where we really come and, and, and I guess I, I should also mention that I, I was kind of hard on energy recovery wheels. I, I do think they are a great device. <laughs> and when they're, when they're applied properly, they can save yes. energy. And when you have an exhaust airstream, you need to, you know, or you want to recover energy out of, it is great. But just don't make that your item right. relying on for dehumidification. Size your outside air to handle it almost uh, the latent load, almost as if you don't have that energy recovery. Because you, you don't want, I don't want to count on it, right? Um, right. So, you know, I, you, you can maybe account for a little bit, but definitely make sure you have a means to dehumidify the space, even if you're not getting that outside air uh, dehumidification benefit from the wheel, I guess, is what, or outside air moisture reduction benefit from the wheel. All right, nicely explained. Moving on, uh, if I am looking at the chart and vapor pressures, is there a way to estimate how fast we can expect to see the vapor migrating from higher to lower pressures? Mm, that is a I tough would one. Say, to I would say probably. <laughs> it, it's going to it's gonna come down brain power really to tell no you. Way. But. Yeah, you have to know the permeability of your, yeah. your building envelope. Um, and it's pretty it's reasonable to be able to find the permeability of each uh, item in that envelope. It is more difficult to find the permeability of the assembly because we're going to have to make some assumptions on how well that assembly was assemb you know, put together. Was it very well assembled? Was it was there a bunch of holes punched in it? So I don't, uh, I guess I haven't done the research to really see how easy it is to determine the overall permeability of a building. Uh, mm -hmm. envelope component. Um, there's probably some softwares out there that have it in it. Um, ASHRAE's probably done some studies on it, but I'm not specifically versed in it. But what I will say is typically, um, vapor pressure is typically not your main driver. Uh, usually there's enough leakage in a building uh, that the, the, the actual air movement is going to be your main enemy um, as far as getting moisture into the building. If you have infiltration problems, um, and controlling infiltration is going to be more critical than trying to control, um, you know, vapor pressure, permeability of a surface. Mm -hmm. but. Okay. Now, is there a difference between CHW coils versus DX coils for these calculations? Is one, is one more effective than the other? Um. In terms of dehumidification, the the air. So he, so here's how we dehumidify, right? I'm going to go back to one of these slides. So uh, one of these I had thought we might get a question like this. So I have I, I included the dew point here, right, of the air. So the dew point of the, in this example is 59 degrees. 
So how do we dehumidify air is we create a surface that's colder than the dew point of the air, right? So the coil, let's say this coil is at 46 degrees or whatever, um, with 51 degree leaving, that dehumidifies the air. The, the air doesn't care, um, obviously, what medium's inside, whether it's a DX uh, R410A or it's chill water or it's glycol, et cetera, it just cares about the surface temperature. Um, you know, is one more efficient than the other? I'll give you the answer that, you know, I've been getting for 25 years, it depends, right? It depends on the scenario, the size of the equipment, yada, yada, yada. But um, as far as effectiveness with removing um, moisture, it's really, it doesn't care, the air doesn't care. Now I can tell you if you have DX, you can, the ability to reheat is pretty simple if you're using the right product, right? Because now you have the hot gas that you would normally um, reject to the atmosphere. You can take that gas, put it in a coil, and you can reheat the air that way. I think we had a slide showing that um, somewhere here. This is kind of a version. It says heat recovery, but it's hot gas reheat. So um, anything to add to that, John? The, the only thing I'll, I'll add to mention into there is, is with a DX coil, you do have to be mindful of potentially freezing the coil. Uh, because when you have that compressor running, the, the refrigerant is mm -hmm. rejecting energy to the outdoors and it has to absorb energy from something. And if, if you don't have enough airflow, it turns the water into ice on that coil. And then you would have an ice block that reduces yeah. airflow more and then it freezes faster. And then you can get this cascading effect where eventually you'll have a compressor shut down on, on you know, low suction head pressure or uh, worst case, if there is nothing to shut it down, it'll sit there until it, until it, potentially causes damage when you start getting liquid refrigerant back because you don't have enough heat transfer to boil off the liquid refrigerant you've created. Um, with good controls, that's not a problem, but we're just saying, you know, possible worst case scenario. So with a chilled water coil, you know, even if I'm running a uh, an ice system where I've got ice storage tanks, and I'm getting, you know, 38 degree water out of the, out of the ice tanks, um, I can run 38 degree water through a coil with the fan off. It, it won't freeze. You know, the chiller might not care for that. Or, you know, if you run in a chiller and you're getting 42 degree water out of the chiller, you're getting into the coil and it's coming back at 42 degrees, 44 degrees. Chiller may not like that, but, but as far as the coil's controllability, um, you can just turn the valve all the way open and get cold water and you don't have to worry about uh, freezing that coil. Um, you know, arguably, unless you're running a glycol mix and you've got the, you know, below 32 degrees, but typically uh, going out to air handlers, you're not really going to see, you know, 42 is pretty, pretty standard. You might see, you know, all the way down into the, into the 30s if you do have a nice storage system, but um, you're, you're not really going to have uh, to worry about potentially freezing the coil if you start slowing the fan down too much or have other other constraints on the system. So that's the one benefit to chilled water in that scenario is I can keep a coil cold without worrying about needing to also keep a refrigeration uh, system that's a, a you know DX system happy. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have to answer questions. If we were not able to get to your question, not to worry, one of our team members will reach out to you. Thank you, Tony and John, and thank you all for joining.